All right, I'll be able to ask, let you guys ask some questions at the end. Um, but first of all, I'm just going to clear out the air. Yes, this was me. So, yes. Yay! Yay! I just thought I'd clear out the air so you're not Googling on the phone. Like, does it look like her? Is it her? I'd be like, what class are you? And they're trying to figure it out. Yes, it's me. I was here in the spring and then I'm back now. Um, but today, it's not about headlocks. It's not about who has the toughest military school, who has the best chow food, or the worst chow food, um, what kind of a service um, branch you're going into. Today, I want to actually talk about being an entrepreneur. So, um, is there anybody in this room that thinks of themselves as an entrepreneur? No one? Well, you got a couple. Look at you. Good for you. So, hopefully, by the end of this, I want every single one of you to think of yourself as an entrepreneur. So, um, oh, excuse me. Um, when I was a cadet, if someone asked me, am I an entrepreneur, I'd be like, no. I was like, I don't have my own business. I don't want to, like, be the boss. I don't want to have to... Um, run my own business or try to make millions and be on Shark Tank. But being an entrepreneur isn't about owning your own business. Being an entrepreneur is a mindset. It's a mindset of how innovative you are. And it's also a mindset of having a vision of opportunity and growth. So today, I'm going to have you think like an entrepreneur. So the first thing is to actually recognize your opportunity. So entrepreneurs, they like to um, Things outside the box. They're thinking about themselves. They're thinking about the organization. Overall, entrepreneurs try to think about opportunity first. So you don't like something. That's typical. We go to military school. There's lots of things we don't like. But what you'll hear in military school, you'll hear in your civilian jobs, you'll hear in the military is, oh, I don't like this, or this sucks, I don't want to do this. Entrepreneurs, we're problem solvers. So we like to think outside the box, um, like, how can we do it differently? How can we take a complex problem and make it simple? How can we, most importantly, implement it at a low cost to no cost? So when I was in the Marine Corps, I was down at the Marine Aircraft Group out in Beaufort, South Carolina. As a comm officer, I was in charge of the combat operations centers. We had two of them for that unit. And those are about $6.8 million of equipment. The problem with those was how we inventory them. There was no kind of organization to the inventory pieces of it. There was about, I want to say, 1,200 pieces each. So that's 2,400 pieces. And it would take us about a week to do the full inventory. And even then, you feel like, did I really get everything down to the last cord? Well, what we did was we collaborated together, and we found simple solutions to fix a complex issue that cut down our inventory process that took a week down to a single day, less than a day, essentially. And that we had a 100% success rate of finding everything. And when you save manpower hours like that, you're also saving dollars. So for our unit alone, the manpower that it took for quarterly inventory saved the unit $177,000 a year. So what seems like such a small thing, oh, this one process takes us too long, we're actually saving an organization over $100,000 a year in labor hours. So the next one is, being comfortable with taking risks. And when I say that, that doesn't mean, oh, you should go out bungee jumping or you should run the block in civvies. Uh, what that means is you are comfortable with the uncomfortable. So a risk taker is you're OK with investing your time and energy into something that may not pay off. You know, we get taught that you know, you'll work hard and it's going to pay off. But the real life is it's not going to pay off for you all the time. Sometimes you're going to have to take those risks and be uncomfortable and okay with coming up with the perfect solution, thinking about how it's going to save you money, how maybe this is going to make your organization a little bit better. And then you find out, you know, they don't want to implement it. And that's just part of it. But then also is the reward of getting that million dollar idea or finding that cost savings to your unit. So be a risk taker. Will you fail? Maybe. Will you get shot down? Maybe. But you are helping solve the problem instead of just kind of being the naysayer in the background. A lot of my success as a military officer wasn't because I was the smartest one in the room. When I went to VMI, I didn't have the act stars. And honestly, I probably wouldn't even been invited to this program. But what got me the success, I ended up being at the Pentagon, was my vision for strategic growth and also looking at opportunities and exploiting them. For example, 
implementing change like we did with the COC. It's being able to have that courage and go up to someone, no matter what their rank and position, and tactfully say, hey, sir, hey, ma'am, I have this really great idea. This is what's happening. This is what it's causing. And here's what we can do to make the place a little bit better. So the next one is use your creativity in innovation. So regardless if you're going to go in the civilian world, regardless of if you're going to go in the military, you're going to have fires everywhere that you go. You're going to have issues. You're going to have meltdowns. You're going to be like, why did I do this career? But they're going to happen. The best thing that you can do is just challenge yourself to think innovatively and creatively to get through those obstacles. Um, for example, I own a luxury retail store. Right now, retail has been in a slump overall across the nation. Um, this summer, we lost a little bit of our foot traffic. But instead of um, doing the traditional route of, oh, let's get print ads, let's look at our marketing, let's go on TV, we implemented an ambassador program where we have 14 ambassadors that um, they're required to come in and do store try-ons. They have to post on their social media. They have to do a giveaway. They have to come in as um, host an event for a store. Well, within three months, that has grown our social media profiles by 40% in followership of local women in our area. And that also created an increase in revenue and foot traffic to our store. So instead of just sitting back and being like, man, this sucks, you know, I don't know what to do, or let's just do what, you know, the standard thing is, is just go buy a $1,700 TV ad. You know, we decided to think outside the box, something that actually didn't cost us any physical dollars other than our inventory itself. The next one is communication and collaborate well with others. So who here thinks they're the smartest person in the room? Oh, no one brave enough. Well, even if you do secretly think that you are the smartest person in the room, collectively, you guys are much smarter as a whole. And even though you might have a great idea, you would be very surprised at what you can come up with if you just talk to each other, collaborate with each other. If you have an idea or solution, run it by your friend, run it by your peer, and say, hey, what do you think about this? Or is there any way that we can make it better? Um, the best ideas come back from collaboration and feedback. Um, don't feel intimidated to say that you have a roadblock. When you go to military schools, a lot of you guys are going to feel that thing of, hey, I don't want to say that I'm having issues, or I don't want to say I have a failure or a roadblock. But saying, hey, I have a situation. This is what's happening. How can we do it together? That's enabling you to fix a problem instead of dealing with it on your own. So for example, when I was at the Pentagon, I worked under programs and resources. So I did the IT budget for the Marine Corps. It was actually funny. They thought it was easier for the commo to learn the budget than to teach the budget people the comm language. But um, with that, there was a lot of issues in the submission process. It took over like two to three weeks to submit the IT budget, and there was a lot of issues. And what that resulted in was me, a sole captain, checking about 6,000 lines on an Excel sheet. One by one is checking budget numbers. So could I do it alone by myself? No, I just got there. So what we did was collectively as a whole, programs and resources, a Marine Corps C4, and also some very talented tech folks. We got together, we talked about the processes, we talked about what was going wrong, and we implemented solutions that got it down to a span of like three or four days. So that was another example of us working well of a, you know, hey, I could have had that great idea, but there's no way that I could have realistically done it as well as we did and within the time crunch as we did if I was to do it by myself. And the other thing is um, developing transferable skills. So what I mean by that is don't be afraid of trying things that you're interested that may not be in your career path or it just might be a fleeting spot. If you want to take an art class, take an art class. If you want to you know, go at the fire department, go volunteer at the fire department. Um, when I say transferable skills, it doesn't mean things that you think are going to directly affect your career that you think you're going to have. You don't know what career you're going to have down the road. You don't know if you're going to stay in the military, you're going to get out of the military. You don't know where these skills are going to lead from one to the other. So when I was at the Pentagon, I actually started blogging. And blogging actually ended up helping me understand website development when I had my business. Before I had my business, I took class on Adobe Illustrator. So now I do a lot of my own graphics and marketing information that has also led me to being a marketing manager at a major PR firm in my area. 
So you just never know where those skills are going to go to. So it doesn't matter if no one in the core is interested in it or if it's something different than your friends are. I really encourage you to look outside of what everyone's interests are a whole. And if there's something you have an interest in, just try. You just never know where that skill set is going to be valuable to you down the line. And the last one is be flexible. A lot of you guys have 5, 10, 20 year plans of where you're going to go. I was dead set on being in the military forever. And I actually voluntarily left after like seven years. Um, if you would have asked me if I was going to get my master's degree, like when I was in college, you probably would have laughed at you. I was like, no, I'm done. This is never going to happen. Uh, if you would have told me I was going to open a retail store and then work for a public relations firm, I'd be like, you're crazy. No, that's just not on my pipeline. So I went from military officer to super girly fashion house, and I would have never known that was happening. So some of you guys, you're going to think you have this exact career progression that you're going to go, I'm going to go this, I'm going to be a Navy SEAL, I'm going to get out, or I'm going to do my 20. And the, thing, the fact of the matter is you don't know what you're going to do with your life. We talk about disruption at this conference, but what that really means is you're going to have a lot of disruption in your life. And some of it's going to be sparked by you, and some of it's going to be external influences that are out of your control. So even though you have that idea of, I would like to do a full career in the military, you should also be thinking about your options, your skill sets. What's, what are you going to do if this doesn't work out? How are you going to pivot from that? Because that's what's thinking like an, like an entrepreneur. You don't know what future life events are going to happen and how you're going to handle it. Every single one of you is going to fail at some point of your career. And there's going to be many of you in this room that are going to fail multiple times. And that doesn't mean big failures. That means that you're going to be in a big failure corner over there. It just means that you're going to have obstacles that you're going to have to get over. And if you have embracing change, you can take risks, you can look for opportunities where there haven't been before, and you can adapt to disruption. You can be ready for anything. It's going to make you a lot more pliable and moldable for any type of position out there. Um, I will leave a lot of time for questions. So does someone have a first question for me? Yes. Correct. Um, I had this conversation with another cadet with a, at the Entrepreneur Summit that we had this spring. You know, if that's a pipeline dream, it's okay to put those dreams on the back burner. But you can also, like, if you know you're going to take a few business classes, you know, go work or volunteer for a program that's going to help you. You know, if you think you're going to be in a business, take, like, some Adobe Illustrator classes. Take, like, some blogging classes. You know, find little ways to kind of feed that dream, even if you think that that dream won't come true right away. Yes? Um, my major here was actually in psychology. Um, then I went to the Citadel. I got my master's degree in project management. I got out, honestly, because I wanted to have a family. I met a three-star general. She was going through a divorce. And it just kind of made me kind of have my own internal questions. I know there's a lot of uh, military. I have a lot of military friends out there that have successful marriages in the military. I personally just did not want to have a family in the military. Um, it just kind of made me realize I could be successful, I could be a colonel general, but truly would I be happy? So I had to pick between my own happiness and our career success. But in doing that, I found a completely different route that has also led to happiness and career success as well. Yes? Yeah. I would say, honestly, the biggest thing for me was adversity. You know, I had a lot of setbacks. I had to learn a lot of things. Um, it was really difficult to find myself here, and I had a lot of just growing pains with being a cadet. And I think overall that has made me a stronger leader today because I didn't have that perfect career progression. I wasn't, you know, that perfect ranker. I didn't have everything right and get the academic stars. I had a lot of um, challenges of finding myself and understanding my strengths and my values. And I think having those adversities has made me dig deep, 
fight for what I want, and also figure out who I am as a person and what I want. Um, that would be more of an opportunity for me. Um, that is where my wheelhouse is different than most people that own clothing stores. Um, they see it as I just really love clothes. Me, when I was at DC, I actually reviewed active wear, so I saw that as a small niche opportunity. So um, it's a really um, great dream of mine because we have people that come to my store and they think that we're a na national franchise just walking in. We have people from Miami, New York, Chicago coming in and I'm like, wow, why don't we have this in Chicago? Why don't we have this in Miami? You know, ideally, you know, we're doing our own private label right now. We're going to be expanding to a few stores. And then my ultimate dream for that one would be to sell to a retail group so that they can grow it across the country. I would like someone else to, I would like to sell my baby <laughs> and let someone else raise my baby. Other questions? Got plenty of time for questions. Yes. Did you find that opportunities uh, given to you as an officer in the Marine Corps help you uh, leave your company, especially during the founding stages of it? Yes. I would say that most of my successes have come from being a military officer. And what I mean by that is that, especially for the Marine Corps, one of the things they tell us over and over as a Marine officer, especially if you're a ground contract, is you're here to lead Marines. They go, if you want to be an artillery officer, if you want to be infantry, it's like find another service branch to work for. Because here, like the Marine Corps' biggest focus is growing and developing Marines. So for us, every single job that I've had was completely different than my last. I was constantly um, being thrown into a new position I knew nothing about. Um, my first uh, billet, I was down in Beaufort, South Carolina at the Marine Aircraft Group 31 with a bunch of fire pilots. Pretty much I did base infrastructure comm, which out of the six months of comm school had nothing to do with what I was doing currently. And then I was deployed to Djibouti, Africa, where I did global force management um, as a joint staff billet. And um, from there, I was planning mission requirements f up to five years in advance. And, um, and then from there, I came back, got my master's, then went to the Pentagon to work out programs and resources for the budget, um, budget and investment programs for the Marine Corps IT department. So every single one had nothing to do with the other. Every single one, I had to throw myself into it. I had to aggressively start learning from scratch and something I knew nothing about. And I tried to make it a better place before I left. So I think with that, that's what makes me successful as a retail owner. Because a lot of people, they're just blown away that, oh, you don't, you've never had retail experience? Like, no. But, you know, I'm used to fighting. I'm used to um, hungering down, hustling, working hard, learning everything about what you can learn. Because um, early in my career, I would see some people that were even lieutenants, they would act like they just knew it all already. <laughs> I'm like, man, you got so much to learn. Because, like, even I'll be on my deathbed and I will still be learning. I will still be finding new skill sets and finding new things to, um, to grow from. So I think absolutely that was like the one thing um, that had made me successful from the Marine Corps. Yes. So that was actually the scariest part of getting out of the Marine Corps is, you know, here I am voluntarily getting out. I was a, I was a upper, I was a captain. You know, I still had a few years left for major. Um, so I left a very secure, high paying paycheck. And when you uh, voluntarily get out of the military, it's a long process. I think I put in my request to leave in January, and it was probably around June, July was my final um, in a service day. So you have to leave before you have any kind of job opportunities, and it's the same with my retail store. So um, even that was a terrifying ordeal. And when I got out, I got accepted into General Electric's uh, Aviation's Junior Officer Leadership Program. It was a very uh, prestigious program for military officers. The problem was when I started it, I was not, um, I was not an engineer. I was not a pilot. So it was just very hard for me, even though it was such a great company to work for, to get 
uh, emotionally just excited about source lines of code, essentially. <laughs> I probably would have had more uh, sentiments towards a broomstick than something invisible on an aircraft. It's like some tiny minute feature on an aircraft that's invisible. Um, so from there, um, my husband, when I got um, pregnant with my daughter, we decided for me to be a stay-at-home mom. Uh, ladies in the room, you find out once you're used to like working and going to service academies or going to military school and going to the military, it's very hard to stay at home. <laughs> it's very hard to just um, raise your kids. So from there, we um, we were looking at other projects and stuff to get into. That's the crazy part. My husband actually opened up a restaurant at the same time I opened up a store, so we both lost our incomes at the same time. Uh, very risky. I do not recommend it. Uh, <laughs> but it was just how the timing worked out. Um, we invested cash in my store, um, so that's always that's always a little uh, uneasy feeling when you take your safety net under. But for me recently, you know, it's like making making good choices, good long-term decisions. For example, right now. We're, not, we're still in the startup phase, so we're not making a ton of revenue. The easiest way for me to take revenue from my store would be to take my employees and um, cut the daytime hours. Well, if I cut the daytime hours, that's all my stay-at-home moms, the ones that want to stay with me forever, the ones that have really unique skill sets. So for me, the more important issue became of, okay, we need to protect those people. We need to think about that long-term goal and being able to empower them instead of just cut them down and me run everything. So everyone got trained up, and now I ended up leaving and becoming taking on a full-time role at a PR firm, which also helps my business because that's a whole new skill set that I've never done before and that I'm learning about. Did that answer all your questions? Okay. Any other? Yes. So it seems like you want to like go to the Marines and switch over to like the Navy and having your own business. What do you see yourself like down the road? Like how can you set and sell your business? Um, down the road, selling my business will not be for a while. That's probably within 10 years or so from now. Um, I am very happy at my PR firm. I love to brand. I love, um, that's something I learned about myself that I didn't know when I was in the Marine Corps. I did not know when I was at VMI. I actually have this creative side that I get to pursue by helping build other, other businesses and other clients through my PR firm. And um, that's something I'll probably continue to do. In addition to, I've already started some consulting. Other questions? I have more. We still got, oh dear, we have a lot of time. I must have talked fast. Ask them up or this is going to be really awkward. <laughs> Do you have any specific advice on how to uh, develop the ability to recognize opportunities? Yeah, I mean, I would say opportunities lie where you see problems, you know. Um, and that can be just as a cadet, you know, if you have an issue and it keeps happening over and over and over, it's not just saying, hey, this is wrong. He's like, hey, you guys are doing this, this is stupid. Like, why are we doing it? It's just thinking about, okay, why are they doing it that way? How could we do it differently? And if we did it differently, how is it going to affect, you know, everything else that's going on on post? How is it going to affect all the other people? It's kind of just taking yourself out and your needs and looking at the overall needs. That's how you see opportunities because it's not just what's in it for you. So having this entrepreneur mindset isn't just about you. A lot of the things that I helped fix in the Marine Corps, I saw zero benefit from. But we did make it better for the people after me. And I think that is the most important thing, is that finding things that maybe aren't working around posts, that aren't working while you're in college, and finding things to, um, to make better that even you may not benefit from, but others after you. If it has more power, so think of it like, kind of like how you would think clients. Everyone operates different. You have to understand the motions of the people that you're approaching to. So I'm sure L Train has a completely different personality than someone else on post. So you want to make sure that who you're, you know, who you're going to be approaching, kind of understand his wheelhouse, his perspective, like or his or her perspective, their priorities. Make sure they, un, you know, they understand and see the values. Sometimes people see different values in things. Some people they see it on a time thing. They see it, you know, dollars wise, or they just see it's a little bit easier for everyone. Um, making sure you're not 
wasting their time with things that really can't be implemented. So if you have an issue, you know, already start thinking about the ways that you can make it better and come up with a solution before you present it. Now, does it have to be a complete solution? No, but you should already have a good idea of what you want to try before you arrange that meeting and say, hey, Colonel so-and-so, our major so-and-so, I know this has been happening in the core a lot, and we've been given a lot of thought, you know, I would really like to do X, Y, and Z. Would you like to sit down and talk about it? Or would you, you know, would you like to have, see if we could arrange a committee and try to get some troubleshooting and see how we can make it better? And I know sometimes they're gonna shoot you down. Like I had the most perfect plan to for the crew team at VMI, and it got shut down. We actually had like 80, I think 80 cadets put their name on the list to sign up. We thought about every single little detail and they just said no. No idea why, they just said no. So you're gonna experience that too, but that's good because um, you should get comfortable with people saying, you know, oh, we're not gonna do this. Because one of these days they're gonna say yes and that's where the true opportunity lies. So if you get timid and you keep worrying that they're gonna keep shutting you down, shut you down, keep trying. As long as you're respectful, as long as you're polite and you deliver well, you know, there's no cost in bringing up an idea to someone. Because all it does is take one chance to have a really good idea implemented. Any other questions? <coughs> questions, questions. Oh dear. <laughs> yes. <laughs> do anything differently. I probably wouldn't have started as an engineering major at VMI. <laughs> I found out it's no knock against engineering department. I came into VMI thinking, I love math. I love math so much. And then I took calculus. I'm, like, I'm so bad at math. I'm like, and then so I thought like one thing that I was really good at, I was really terrible at. But then I figured out that there's actually two different lanes of math. It's like um, swimmers and runners. Usually you'll have a really good runner, you'll have a really good swimmer. Rarely there's people that can do both. That's math. So you have your calc people and then you have your stats people. And I only found this out because I was studying for my ASQ black belt, which is very stat heavy, and I was at my master's degree at the Citadel. So here I have professors in engineering, and I'm going up to them, hey, can you give me help with my statistics? And they're like, I can't help you. <laughs> So that's probably the one thing is I would you know I would like to do over is I realize that my brain is a statistic nerd. I love stats. I love Excel sheets. Not so much calcrafts. They kind of make me. Ugh. But lesson learned with my brain. Someone else had a question. Do you have any specific memories of BMI that you often look back on? And I mean, besides the obvious ones, like which, what, what, like what would those be for you? I actually look back a lot with uh, Colonel Brody just because he makes me laugh so much. Um, and Sergeant Major Neal. Um, you guys remember Sergeant Major Neal? Yeah, he was pretty awesome. Um, we lost our honorary brother at um, Grand Sergeant Mercadante. That was pretty sad for me and something I, I reflect back a lot. Um, I don't have any, like I guess, key memories that I look back and smile. Um, I think my biggest thing was Towards the end of my cadet ship, I stopped caring what I th what people thought of me, and that wasn't like, oh, I'm just gonna do whatever. It was just of like, I'm not gonna fit your mold, and that's okay. It's like you know, if I want to do something, I'm gonna do it and try it, and that's perfectly fine. Like my um, first class year, I was actually the very first female um, volunteer firefighter at the Lexington Fire Department. And how that started was just, I saw it in the yearbook, and for a few years I thought, oh, that's cool, you know, I thought, oh, there's, no, there's no girls there, I was like, this is gonna be weird. And I was like, you know what, I just need to do it. So I did it, and I just signed up, and it was actually a really cool experience. The guys were great, uh, there were a few females after that, and I think right now we have some female cadets currently as um, volunteer firefighters. And then there's like yeah, the whole Citadel thing, which is actually, um, it's like really, and they remind me every year because they search me and they Google me and it just doesn't go away. Like I think they linked my LinkedIn profile this time around, but um, I guess in all seriousness of that one, the thing that makes me a little bit proud about that moment was not because the fact that it happened or I was involved in it was, um, I was the seventh class of females. And when I went through, um, there was a lot of older alumni that still didn't want females there. And they're still really um, abrasive and very defensive of having us. And I think 
overall what that photo did was really soften their approach and like acceptance of us. <coughs> Excuse me. I saw another one. Yes. Sure, since we have time, and maybe I'll cut down on the individual explanations you guys will make me give you later. So, my first class year, we had the Citadel game at the Citadel. Why, I do not understand why they did this, but they decided out of the whole ginormous stadium to put the Citadel cadets right next to the VMI cadets. That made no sense whatsoever. I mean, really, they could have put them on the other side of the football field and, you know, separated us a little bit. So um, I was on the cheerleading squad then. We don't have cheerleaders anymore. Um, but um, we were at our game, doing our thing, uh, rah, rah, rah. Well, the Citadel cadets, they kept running by, like, seven or eight of them with the flag. So it's like, woo, woo. And they're running by with the flag. And then, like, every time they did this, like, we're going to jump them. We're going to jump them. So they had this big, like, like stairs and it was like the stadium, it was like a drop off. So it wasn't like they were like level with us. Well, after seven or eight times, they finally jumped them and it like migrated over to us. And I'm like, okay. And I just jumped in and I'm like, oh, I just didn't think anybody saw it. I mean, honestly, I didn't think anybody even noticed me at all. And then that morning that was like, I heard there was a photo and then I heard there was a video and I was like, oh God, what did I do? Because then I thought, I'm going to get kicked out. I'm going to get kicked out. Oh, my gosh. Because anything with PR, like, I was the class that we, I was the rec class that we got in trouble over the really bad Halloween photos that came out, uh, <laughs> like the really, really bad Halloween photos. So I already knew that, like, bad PR is not good. So I was thinking, oh, God, here I am. I'm going to have to debate this. But then I see L Train at my room, and I lived in the sinks. He's just like, looking at me, and I'm like, oh, God. And he comes in my room, and it's just like, and I'm like waiting for it and waiting for it waiting for it. And then he's like, give me a little lecture on PR and not talking to the media. And he's like, oh, by the way, good job. You get optional hate down, but don't tell people, <laughs> which I just did you. But it's OK, you know, I guess, you know, 12 years after the fact. But yeah, so it was kind of like an unofficial approval. And then my wrestling coach at the time, I was doing the PE wrestling. I'm, you guys still have to do wrestling? Yeah, so then they're like, oh, I tell you the extra credit for you. I'm like, okay, I'll take it. <laughs> but yeah, that's what happened with that. Um, it wasn't a really big deal for me. I just thought it was funny once I found out I wasn't going to get kicked out for it. Um, I was a super senior fifth year man just because I switched my major from engineering. And um, they were um, worried I was going to get kidnapped, so I had like two people with me during the Citadel game. It's my bodyguards. <laughs> One guy with the name Ox, because he was a power lifter. <laughs> so they were very concerned about my safety during the Citadel game. But I mean, other than that, that was a, so that was a, a funny experience. It was fun to look back on. Um, it was fun, uh, something funny that, you know, a legacy that continues through the, for VMI that has also helped soften, you know, our whole acceptance of females at VMI. Any questions? I don't think he tapped. I think he, you know, I did sweep the leg, but that was it. <laughs> Aside from financial uncertainty, what would you say was the hardest part of starting up your business, like in the very beginning stages? Um, it's kind of like starting anything else from scratch, except, you know, the, for this one, I had zero mentorship whatsoever. You know, at least when you bounce from. Um, job to job in the Marine Corps, you kind of have someone that will kind of give you little tidbits for doing the, going down the right path or not. For me, it was just the whole uncertainty of owning a business. You know, if you start get a decrease in foot traffic, you're like, well, is it because of the clothes weren't here or is it because of this or that? The, you know, you just, you overanalyze everything when you first start a business. And so you don't really know what that variable is if something is going wrong. So you tend to like overanalyze it. Oh yeah, definitely. It's a little bit harder because like competitors don't want to help you be successful. We're working on that now, but I definitely did not have that when I started. Do you still keep in contact with any of your diet or your rat? Uh, 
Not, not so much my dog, not for any reasons or other. I feel like Facebook has made everyone antisocial because we feel like we know everything in their life, but we don't really talk to them. Um, my rat quit on me. <laughs> Yeah, so I, when I got my rat, it's she was supposed to be a rock star rat, and they were going to give me one that they said that was having issues and that was probably going to quit, so I didn't take another rat because I was like, yeah, I got one good one. I don't need another one. And then she quit a couple years, a couple weeks in. So no rat for me. <laughs> and yes, I had to take out my own trash and all that wonderful stuff. It was okay. I, I survived. I, perce I, I persevered. It was okay. I guess not really seeing, I don't know if there was anything in the Marines per se that helped. Probably my own personality of just seeing a hole. You know, if you see something that's not being exploited, you know, there's, I guess, two different ways of entrepreneurship. It's like, one, you want to fix a problem. If it's there, if it's broken, broken process, something taking too much money, too much time, um, or just causing a lot of errors, you want to fix the plug and make it better. And there's other ones, it's just opportunity for growth, opportunities for exploiting a good idea, a good opportunity. And that's the, you know, the other things we challenge you, too. You may not have any problems, per se, at, uh, um, school, but it's also finding things that are good opportunities. So for me, it was doing the research of like, okay, I know there's no clothing stores that that specifically um, specialize in the athleisure field. So we're like the queen of cozy apparel, like leggings, sweatpants, um, like sweatshirts, t-shirts, all that fun stuff. So it's like seeing what my competitors are bringing to the table. So I looked at what Lululemon was doing. I looked at like Athleta and Lole and all those brands. And even then, the only kind of athleisure brands that were offered were ones that was their own brand label. So there were no ones that were kind of like an Ever Eve or Anthropology where they offer all different types of brands under one house. Anytime that you have an opportunity like that, you know you're going to have a little bit more success than others if the audience is broad. I mean, if you have like one little small niche, I mean, you still need everyone to like it. Like for us, it's like we weren't competing against all the clothing stores. We were our own category, and it wasn't like we were a bike specialty, you know, clothing store or anything like crazy small niche. It was something that still appealed on the broad scale, but it was also um, a gap in the market that wasn't available to people. Yes. <laughs> Always yes for belt loops. Okay. For those BMI cadets who don't know, belt loops is a rel relatively new. Uh, Why? You guys have belt loops? Yeah. yeah. The, you, what? My okay, God. so back to the question. Yes or no? Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Change is amazing. Actually, we were the last year, my frat year, we wore the poly wool. So we kind of had um, like the Norwich cadets, like the little gray pants that they weren't wool, but they were kind of like a nice breezy, lightweight summer fabric. Yeah, we had that one year and then it went away. And they brought these god awful white things that don't match your white tops. And then we didn't have belt loops either. So they kind of like make their way up and it was horrible. So, see, there are good changes at VMI. You have no idea, but they, they do exist. Yes? Uh, did you go into your business with a partner? And if you did or didn't, what's your recommendation on finding a good partner? I, I, can see the business, I can see the benefits of having a partner and not having a partner. I actually did it alone. Um, my husband actually has two friends that he went in with for his restaurant, so it's kind of interesting because I could see the parallels between both of them. For me, it's like I'm a dictator, so I get to do whatever the whatever I want to do, <laughs> and I don't really have to ask questions. It's not really just doing everything that Carrie wants to do, but it's, I don't have to vet it. I don't have to um, make someone else see the value of my idea. But the downside of that, too, is you know I don't have anyone to cross-check or collaborate or you know have another uh, valued partner. Um, one of the, the people I'm actually I'm actually looking at a partnership with actually my PR firm. They wouldn't be a 50-50, but there is definitely a lot of value of having a partner. But for me, starting a business without a partner, um, it actually helped make my momentum go a lot faster. Other questions? Uh, 
uh, from failure. It's hard for me to pick because I had a lot, <laughs> but that's okay. I, you know, I think that's a lot of things. We don't talk about our failures. Um, we don't talk about things that go bad in our life. Uh, I can think of like one of my recent ones. Um, you know, we bought, I got these nice, they're called Friends headphones, and they're like, they got these like rose gold caps and you can unscrew them. It's like the girly version of like Beats headphones. We spent like $3,000 $3, for that wholesale order. We didn't sell a damn one. <laughs> As the people just, we found out, didn't want to go to clothing stores for their electronics purchases and even like slash them at half off, they still weren't moving. So you kind of learn things on the fly like that. What, are, what aren't moving, what is, like we'll never do electronics again, it's banned. But it's like we learned, okay, let's make lemons and a lemonade. So now when we get donation requests, we're like, oh, here's these wonderful headphones and they get thrown into our tax write-offs. <laughs> I guess the other, you know, failure thing is like the foot traffic, you know, the ambassador program was really important to us. That's something, you know, you know, a pretty big failure where you're trying to drive people into your store. We're in new development, so we're in a new upscale um, development that's a suburb of Grand Rapids. And they're, now we're like one of the only um, stores that are in that, that facility right now. So uh, we were told everything would be done now, and we're about two years away from everything being done. So we, we definitely see a lot of dips in our foot traffic. and. Um, what was really um, interesting about our ambassador program, and that's probably one of my most, um, I, probably my most accomplished moments I'm really proud of, figuring that nut out because not only did it help grow our social media, it also increased our foot traffic and it also decreased our labor hours because uh, having a clothing store, I mean, you can bunch of guys, you guys do everything online so you probably can't relate too much. But, you know, for girls, we like to see everything. We're on Instagram. We have to take video and photos in our outfit. It really helps sell the product. Well, the problem is when an employee does that, you know, we're trying on 15 to 20 outfits a day. You're like, I am tired. I'm sweaty and I should not be sweaty from trying on clothes. And it's nice because now we have a steady stream of people that we're not paying to come in and try on our clothes for us. You know, it's different um, creativity, it's different, you know, um, people's different body shapes and personal tastes that are outside of our uh, current employees. And that's just so many hours that we don't have to do. Like so much of our um, Insta stories, which is with social media marketing, you, know, you guys won't really experience a lot of marketing <laughs> when you go into the, the military. But for uh, retail stories, we do a lot of social media um, presence with our marketing. Insta stories are kind of like the way to go these days. And for that, like we kind of have a steady stream of pushed content every day. So instead of having to come up with stuff every single day now, um, we have a lot of pushed content thanks to our ambassador program. And um, that was something that just resulted out of a bad experience and a failure of uh, foot traffic. And now it's a, it's a really big success for us and it's a really big strength for our store. And it's actually something we're packaging and, and we are providing as clients at my um, PR firm. So, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but you made it seem like almost uh, that, like, BMI had failed to live up to the original expectation that you had, and, and kind of your experience at BMI was different in your mind coming into it and the way it ended up coming out. What would you tell to someone who is kind of experiencing that now, and, and what advice would you give to them going into the future? I think, yeah, you know, it wasn't that it didn't meet my expectations with BMI. You know, I still had a good cadetship. I just think I just got off to a rocky start, and I think with the core being so small, I mean, you guys, a lot of you know this, it's very hard to change people's opinions about you once they get established. So whether they think you're, you know, a good cadet, bad cadet, mediocre cadet, it's not saying I was like a big turd, but it was just like, once they kind of make up your mind, you kind of get into like this discouraged mindset. And I think the biggest thing is like, we're in an environment where they want you all to be the same. They want you to go on the same career path. And the thing is, if things aren't working for you and maybe you're not meant to be a ranker or you're not meant to be RDC or be in the cadre, there are other opportunities at VMI that you can get into and that you can learn and have good unique skill sets that will help you outside of um, military school. And I have one more question and we're done. Sorry. Yes. So how do you see your company competing in a market where Amazon is taking over everything online and, and making everything cheaper? And, I mean, you said you have a niche right now. How long does that niche last and where do you go from there? 
Amazon has one issue that I've seen, and I even struggle with this shopping for my daughter, is they have too much of everything, and it's horrible to filter. So if you have like a certain style or a certain like look or preference, like yeah, I think it's excellent if you want to go get trash bags, if you want to get you know paper towels or just regular. I, I need a mount for my phone or a phone charger. I think Amazon is excellent for those type of things, or getting a certain book. But when it comes to getting clothes. Um, I don't even think we're, you know, in this day or age, you need to necessarily go try it on, but it's really hard to find your your own preferences and style. Like if I search women's tennis shoe, I want to find like 10,000 women's tennis shoes, and probably 99% of them I'm going to hate. You know, same if it's any type of shoe, or if it's like women's jeans or pants. So while they are dominating in a lot of aspects, I still think there's a lot of opportunities when it comes to retail clothing unless you just don't care about your clothes at all, and then you'll do good. <laughs> all right, well, as long as I think you guys asked me a ton of great questions. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to be here today and tomorrow, so if you have any questions you want to ask me offline, feel free to ask away.